since 1910, Long Island Railroad is coming into Penn Station. At the beginning, that was not necessarily the aim of Penn Station, but if you look at Penn Station today, the majority of the people coming into Penn Station are servicing Long Island Railroad. About half of the people coming from Long Island want to be on the east side. So we are actually forcing a lot of people to go further west and then come back east. My name is Michael Horatniciano. Uh, I am the president of uh, MTA Capital Construction. And the East Side Access project is one of the projects in my portfolio of $18 billion of construction. The East Side Access project is the ability of bringing Long Island Railroad trains into Grand Central onto the east side of Manhattan. By doing that, commuters coming from Long Island, they would not have to go all the way to Penn Station and then come back to the east side. It's in, in effect a game changer for the railroad to come and have a one-seat ride from Long Island onto Grand Central. From my point of view, of being an engineer, it's probably a unique opportunity for me to do something that would leave behind the world a little better than I found it. The idea here is that Long Island Railroad will actually have a terminal on the east side of Manhattan, and the location is really under Grand Central because we're building it, in effect, 160 feet below Park Avenue. If you ever read Jules Verne, this is it. This is the trip to the center of the earth. We kind of are hidden down and under, and we're doing you know, our work like moles. When you look at the work that was done on, on building the tunnels under the Hudson River and the tunnels under the East River, at that time, no one thought that this is doable. There was a need for someone with courage with determination to say, no, we can do it. The difference between then and now is that now it was more a matter of dollars and cents and will to do it rather than having the technology to do it. This one is of more of a political thing because it uses uh, governmental funds to do it. One of the biggest difference on constructing tunnels looking way back and now is that in 1952, they invented this machine called the tunnel boring machine. It looks, in a way, no different than the shield that was there before. Uh, the difference being that when you had the shield, if it was a soft ground, you just did it by hand. If it wasn't soft ground, you, if it was a rock, you, you, you blasted it, but it was not done with a machine. The tunnel boring machine have a cutter in front, and this cutter churns the, the rock in front, or if it's soft ground, the soft ground. Tunnel boring machines are like inchworms, that they advance, they can advance about six feet at a time. And when you compare it with what the Sandhogs did in those times, it's not that different. The biggest difference being that what we do now is much safer, it's cleaner, there are less risks. I think that we are better now, Edward, although there are always accidents. In those times, they used to blast utilizing dynamite. We're now utilizing a slightly different uh, um, uh, explosive emulex. The theory behind as to how you blast and what a control blast is all about, it didn't change terribly much.
So we are at 55th Street here. We created this cavern from below and marked it out this way. And at the very end, you can see some light there to the left, kind of a whitish rock. We, we actually broke through. You think about Park Avenue, it's under the most expensive real estate in the world. And you really do not want to disturb the peace and quiet of these people, okay? So that's why we actually did the blasting from below, so we won't have anyone complain. The remnants of blasting is, is rock that is kind of, to a certain degree, fractured. It's not a smooth rock. If you have noticed when we had the tunnel boring machine, it leaves behind a very smooth surface. Blasting leaves behind a rough surface. So what we try to do is to, in effect, smooth the surface by spraying shot concrete that is nothing else but a lean concrete that is being sprayed and fills these voids and creates a smoother surface. The need for the smoother surface is so that will not puncture the waterproofing. There are fissures in the rock that allow water to penetrate. You need to put in place a system that will prevent water from actually coming in. The yellow that you see is basically, think of it as an umbrella, and the water is allowed to flow onto the sides, and then it's collected below and is pumped out. So this is managing the water inflow rather than stopping it. You cannot really stop it, you have to manage it. This is today the largest public transit project in the United States. The lessons learned on doing this are incredible. We celebrated 100 years Grand Central in 2013. When they're gonna be done, that will be the next Grand Central for the next 100 years.